I could have written a long introduction um, for this item, but I thought the best way was to just say, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ian M. Banks. Okay. Now, Ian, as everybody knows, your first published book was The Wasp Factory, but you've been writing an awful long time before that. How long before that had you been um, a writer? Well, I mean, I'd, I'd, I... It goes back to primary school, believe it or not. <laughs> um, documentary evidence. I wanted to be a writer from the tender age of uh, primary seven, which I think means 11 years old. Um, the teacher asked us to draw what we wanted to be when we grew up. Uh, this was what, primary seven, uh, about 1964 or something, I don't know. Anyway, um, and uh, so all my friends were drawing, uh, well, it was on the cusp of the time when little boys drew, they still wanted to be like engine drivers, right? So you could still be, it's still sort of a decent thing to, to have an aspiration towards being later life, wasn't it? Uh, a train driver, engine driver. Uh, but also an astronaut, because like, they were like, even more cool, you know, uh, the, those, da those days. And um, I drew, uh, well, I drew an actor. I didn't know how to draw a writer. I didn't, I didn't know what writers really did. Well, they wrote, obviously, but I couldn't. You know, do, do you know now what writers really do? Have you learnt? <laughs> Can I come back to you on that? Okay. Um, yeah. I'll leave the difficult questions to later. <laughs> Thank God for that. Uh, I mean, that wasn't one of the difficult questions. Oh, dear. So this could be a long panel item. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I, so I drew an, an actor and, and, the, and someone on the stage, you know, at the time I had very bright orange hair. Uh, and uh, so I, 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 I agree, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it started out orange, it went ginger, because uh, ginger was actually toned down from my original hair colour, believe it or not. You know. um, then it went brown, and then, no, auburn, and then brown, uh, and now it's gone grey. You know, well, white, it's basically going white, but it looks sort of vaguely sort of. Uh, so, in the midst green. of all this, mm. drawing pictures of actors and dyeing your hair, uh, you were writing, said, were you? It said, and writer. And right Spelled up. correctly, I might add, as well. Um, at the top left-hand corner, it was, um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, just rather poor drawing. I'm not very good at drawing, really. But uh, it definitely said and writer. And it's there in my um, uh, exercise book from Primary 7, so I've got proof of this. Um, and I started trying to write a novel when I was 14. Mm -hmm. um, it had this snappy title of uh, The Top of Poseidon. Poseidon was a missile at the time, and it was like, so it was referring to the warhead of the, of the I, I can't remember why. It's the first of my non-snappy titles, mm -hmm. really. I've had a few, and um, the Hungarian lift jet was sort of the recycled version of that much later, but uh, I'd filled three school jotters full of uh, you know, my, my un ungainly scrawl, and thought I'd written a novel, and I discovered this thing called a word count. <laughs> So I, I, so I got an average, you know, and it cut every single one, obviously, that would be ridiculous. But I got an average, and what I'd actually written, actually, to this day, I'm not clear what, what a novella, what the difference between a novella and a novelette is, you know, but it was one of the, it was a small one of the two, you know. Um, <laughs> I was quite peeved, you know. I was, you know, I, thought, I thought I'd written a book, and I hadn't, you know. But from there, the only way is up. Well, along, most of the time. <laughs> really? <laughs> if you define up as adding more adjectives with each... Mm -hmm. <laughs> up, yes, uh-huh, um, yeah, I was, um, I started trying to write, uh, it was always, well, the very first one I said was, it was a spy story, um, and I sort of finally wrote the, the, the up, updated version of um, the top of Poseidon became the Hungarian lift jet. Lift jets um, were like a bit of technology at the time, it was quite cool. At the time, rather than sort of um, the thrust vectoring that you get in the, the Harrier jump jet, probably the only really successful um, uh, vector take up from landing aircraft, at the time they thought they might be better to have a specialist set of engines just to provide the lift. So very, very, they burn a lot of fuel, but they get you up there when you can start flying and then ordinary engines take over. So it was the opposite approach in thrust vectoring. And like very, very small, compact, but very powerful uh, engines called lift jets were meant to be the, a very sort of cool bit of technology. So that was what, you know, that was was in contention. That was the MacGuffin, as it were. Um, so the Hungarian lift jet, um, and that was that was actually quite long. It was 140,000 words. So it was a proper novel. It was almost two proper novels. Mm -hmm. you, think, you know, novels being quite quite short. And uh, I, I full of adjectives. An absolutely crammed, full of sex and violence, which at the age of 16 I had no real experience of. Um, <laughs> and to this day, still only violence, frankly. You know. <laughs> A boy can dream, you know. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd read a lot of, um, I'd read a lot, of, not so much porn, but I'd read a lot of novels that featured sex. So that's <laughs> the problem, you know. I'd seen loads of big explosions on television, 
Uh, again, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I blame Jerry Anderson for everything. <laughs> um, I just love Thunderbirds. It's the, the, the gratuitous explosion at the start where you, just, you sort of pan across the desert and it's this big sort of, you know, what the, some big industrial plant or oil refiner or whatever. And for no good reason whatsoever, it just gets blown to buggery. <laughs> it's like, yeah! <sighs> um, so, yeah, so I, and I'd read lots of books that had action and mm. violence and so on, so I thought, and I'd watch lots of TV programs, I thought, yeah, I can do that, you know, so... Um. Do you know, I've not spotted in all of this excitement about your early writing, no science fiction, no spaceships, well, no ray no, guns. Well, no, there wasn't, I mean, it was around about, I suppose, it was very early teens that I was, um, I was reading, first reading science fiction, going way, way back, um, and so it'd be about that, I'd have started reading it by then, certainly, I think I started reading the SF in about, um, what's up, you know, deliberately as it were, without just you know, grabbing something at random that turns out to be science fiction, as a pose from around about 12, 13, maybe 14. So certainly it was there, but I felt more comfortable writing uh, stuff that I'd seen. I suppose, um, in a sense, take my templates from television in a way, because there was an awful lot of, um, you know, sort of spy. I, didn't, I hadn't seen that many of the Bond films or anything, but um, we didn't go to the cinema very much, because my mum and dad took me to the cinema a couple of times in Dunfermline. And uh, I always got a flea. I always came back as a little visitor, you know, stowaway. <laughs> <laughs> I have quite sensitive skin. I know I hardly believe it, I am a sensitive soul. And, um, and I always knew about it when I had a flea, you know, getting boils and stuff, you know. Uh, and I, just, I remember several times I suffered the indignity of standing naked in the bath, or standing clothed in the bath, while my mum took all my clothes off very carefully and watching for this little black dot, going, ah, you know. You, know. <laughs> <laughs> you killed Gerald. <laughs> um, <laughs> So we didn't go to the cinema very often, so most of you know, my uh, media, uh, well, uh, you know, motion picture or whatever exposure was, was television, and so I'd lot, watch lots of stuff like uh, you know, Danger Man and The Man From U.N.C.L.E. and stuff like that, so I kind of felt more comfortable with the way. I felt as I knew that sort of arena, and the way I didn't, so I was still kind of in awe of science fiction. Um, but after that, I mean, the, the, next, um, the, the next book was called TTR, a very, 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 very long novel. It was about, I think it was about 400,000 words. Um, it was so long, even the word count <laughs> took me <laughs> prohibitively <laughs> long, actually. Uh, to execute. So, um, and it was sort of, sorry, well, it, it was a near future. Um, it, was, it was very much influenced by both Stand on Zanzibar, by the late and much lamented Mr. Brunner, but also by um, Catch-22. Uh, it was of Heller, and uh, probably more by, by uh, Heller than by Brunner in a way, because it, it was less sort of obviously science fiction or something. But it was set in, in the near future, and it was sort of meant to be a satire. And it was the last book that featured lots of puns as well. Um, I, I had this thing about puns. <laughs> oh, uh, I had this um, character called Dahomey Brezhnev. Um, interestingly, Dahomey, uh, which used to be the name of a country in West Africa, was spelled wrongly with two M's rather than one. Or was it the way around? Uh, yeah, how the memory goes. And Brezhnev was spelt wrong as well, either a Z or instead of an S or the other way around. Um, and Dahomey got involved in all sorts of you know, exciting adventures, the only purpose of which was to, for me to cram in as many puns into these little short stories <laughs> as I possibly could. Um, and as a subsidiary thing, I was also doing, um, my dad uh, started buying me the, started getting us the, uh, the Observer uh, newspaper. At the time, this had a colour supplement, which is quite, sort of quite cool and groovy at the time, you know, in the 60s. And um, I used to sort of do collages. I used to cut out lots and lots of stuff from the, the Observer and do these uh, old collages. I did great big ones that filled my, my, the wall of my bedroom. Hated that wallpaper. And I uh, did small ones that fitted into the book, so the, the Homie Brezhnev stories. Uh, and I was so proud that there was one of the Homie Brezhnev stories that I fight, I'd, I'd been sort of doing a word count and combined with a pun count and dividing one from the other, because I could do arithmetic, you know. Um, <laughs> and I was, getting my, my, I was working at my pun to word ratio, and it was how many words you had to read on average before you got to a pun, right? <laughs> and I was so proud that the very last Homie Brezhnev, it was about half a dozen stories altogether, the very last one, I got it down to under 10. It was like, <laughs> pun to odd ratio of you know, 9.8, <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway, so um, TTR, uh, the big long novel, featured the homie Brezhnev and his um, I had a sidekick called Dog Hat Jamahari, and uh, those gropius Luckfoot was the bad guy. It was a kitchen sink drama, as you can tell. And um, uh, Gropius's sidekick was called Toss Macarb. <laughs> <laughs> that looks really funny when you see it on the page. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it was um, immensely long, and that was 1972, I think that was completed. And uh, after that, basically nothing but science fiction until I gave up because I couldn't get anything and accepted that, by a publisher. Was that the reason for the Wasp Factory? Yeah, I had, um, there was a big, um, I've characterised it in the past as like um, a sort of internal debate. Mm -hmm. 
where the, the smooth suit-like beings within my head were going, uh, I should know what's that with, like the, um, the committed ones, you know, it's a table thumpings, going, you're a science fiction writer, you should be proud to be a science fiction writer, how dare you even think about giving up writing science fiction, even temporarily, desert the cause, just for the miserable self-satisfaction of getting published. <laughs> you useless bastard. <laughs> Whereas, you know, the emollient suits going, mm, mm, well, yes, yes, we hear what you say, obviously. <laughs> However, I think that the way to approach this is to regard an attempt to establish what one might call a bridgehead within the world of publishing. <laughs> from which one might subsequently branch out, as it were, into these other genres like science fiction, whatever it is, um, having you know, done, done this. Uh, so obviously, the Emollient suits won in, the, in that sense. That, um, well, I they just were right, though, weren't they? Well, in a sense, they were. You know, that's why you have these little voices <laughs> in your head. Isn't it? <laughs> um, so yeah, well, it was, it was a, in a sense, it was practicality. I, mean, I, got, I, I realised there were only about, um, I guess only about half a dozen publishers in, in London, you know, in, in Britain, that you could actually, uh, that would actually publish science fiction mm -hmm. to a degree of regularity or professionalism or whatever. And I'd exhausted all those. And I thought, and maybe now that I'd sent in like three novels and got nothing but rejection, I thought, oh no, it's him again. I'd just be rejected out of hand. So I thought, at the very least, I'll get rejection slips from a bigger variety, or, you know, a greater variety <laughs> of publishers. You know. um, so I, I thought, well, obviously, you've got, you have a slightly better chance of getting mainstream publishers because there are more publishers. You're more likely to get to someone, to an editor, and he or she will say, yeah, this is you know, something that we want. Um, but another thing that made a difference was writing a second draft, because I had this, um, Ian's handy writing tips, number one for budding authors, always do a second draft. I <laughs> Sounds wacky, I know. But, uh, I had this totally bizarre idea that what happened was that uh, when you sent your novel in, first of all, it was received, you know, with uh, hosannas and overjoyed, <laughs> over, overjoyed us who had it, yeah. Um, and people would you'd look at it and they'd say, hmm, hmm, well, it, the spelling's frankly atrocious, but that only indicates great creativity, we think. Um, <laughs> it's a bit of a rough diamond, but you know, it's, it's a rough diamond approach I was hoping for. You know, that's what I was certainly providing, was the roughness, you know. Um, <laughs> and I thought they'd, 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 we can do a lot with this. And it hadn't really occurred to me that you actually, what you should actually present them with is like the best possible thing you're capable of and that means going back and reading it carefully and thinking well you don't need all those adjectives for a start you know. uh, that should probably be spelled conventionally I suppose. <laughs> um, so <laughs> So the, the, the attempt to you know, break into the mainstream did coincide. You know, this is my all-out attempt to, to actually finally do it. Uh, but actually, so I was getting towards the age of, at the time, seemed incredibly old, of 30. Uh, obviously, nowadays, you know, why an age of, to pick a number out of the air, 56, for example, doesn't really seem that old at all. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, at the time, this, so if, I can't, uh, if I don't get uh, you know, published by 30, then I'm going to sort of retire. I was, at the time, well, not retire, I was going to go back to Scotland. I was living in London at the time. Mm. Um, and I uh, thought, just go back home and only write, you know, every now and again rather than, you know, every sort of year or whatever. So, um, yeah, the second draft thing coincided with going back to, to do, doing mainstream as it were. Well, the, the Wasp Factory was a big hit. Now, this is a, possibly a dilemma because now you're a successful non-science fiction writer and part of you wants to write science fiction. Was there any reticence among the publishers when you said, you know, I want to do spaceships and stuff. Didn't they say, well, look. Oh, there was a little. Yeah. Yeah, my publisher, it was Macmillan, um, was a handbag publishers, and uh, they didn't really do science fiction. I think they'd done a very, very small amount, but uh, they didn't really, didn't really give consistency. And when I said I wanted to write science fiction, I, uh, I knew this, I said, but I've got this great idea. I'll just go to another publisher. I, you know, when I said it was science fiction, they seemed to be sort of, were sort of cautiously okay about it, you know. Um, I said, but I'm going to, what I'll do is I'll have a, another name, a pseudonym. I shall be John B. McCallan. <laughs> and my editor, so John B. McCallan, mm. why? He said, at the time, it's my two favourite whiskies. <laughs> 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 do you sense a theme developing today? <laughs> um, so it's Johnny, I was a big fan. My favourite blind at the time was Johnny Walker Black Label. So Johnny, Johnny Black, John, John B. And the McAllen was my favourite uh, single malt. So it's my taste of change now, but that's, that's not the point. At the time, I thought John B. McAllen, that sounds, it sounds Scottish. And it's got a B, it's got a middle initial. Because oh, uh, science fiction being, uh, as much as anything, an American uh, sort of genre, as much as it is British or anything else, um, B 
speed this look this looks right you know i was used to seeing well not a lot of the science fiction novels i, I bought uh, by american writers there often was a middle initial in there uh, just why I, I almost became ian e m banks the third frankly you know but um <laughs> Isn't that like Johnny Good? Kind of, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I thought, well, uh, if, if I go to a different publisher, I'd use a different name, that'll be fine and dandy. Mm -hmm. And eventually, my publishers, Macmillan, my, my, specifically my editor, James Hale, again, much lamented, um, I said, well, I think we can, we can do science fiction. You know, so uh, uh, I said, well, we'll keep the same name. But I said, ha, ha can we put the M back? Because this time I'm getting all this grief from my family because uh, uh, technically my full name is Ian Mingus Banks, or Ian Menzies Banks, however you choose to pronounce it. Um, and I'd got grief from, from my family because uh, uh, it's, it's a very long, complicated story, which I won't bore you with. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, my, yeah, I got my uncles come up and saying, what you leave the M out your name for? Are you ashamed of being a mingus or what? <laughs> no, answer me. I'll ask you a question, lad. Come on. <laughs> for that is how we talk in Fife. Um, so I put the M back, you know, which. Uh, I kind of regretted ever since, in a way, because, um, uh, well, that's that same way that Graham Greene had about talking about his novels and his entertainments, you know, the assumption uh, amongst the literary snobs, um, of which are a great many in, um, in British publishing <laughs> and uh, British media, is that I'm sort of writing down, you know, it's an indication of, if I put the M in, it's like taking the quality out, you know, you can, <laughs> ah, I shall put my M in and write some trashy science fiction instead, you know. And, and you still get that, do you? Oh, you still get hell yeah, here. totally, yeah. Oh. I mean, I get it, you know, you, you get a degree of that. You know, whether the initial was in there or not, the very fact that I'm sort of lowering myself to write science fiction, I think it's just regarded as a, a little perversion or something. It's just something I like to do. I should really be doing it in private, frankly, you know, <laughs> with consenting adults. I suppose that's what we are, really. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that, that's, that's definitely there. I think the only genre it's really okay to write within and not lose any literary credibility amongst you know, the, the, uh, the, the snobateriat, as it were, um, is detective fiction. Mm -hmm. That seems to be cool. You can do that, you can get away with that. Again, preferably with a different name, but that, that's all right, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, science fiction, <laughs> beneath contempt, frankly. Yeah. Do you find, though, that your mainstream writing influences your science fiction and then vice versa? Um, I, not particularly. I think it makes the, the uh, delineation clearer in a way. Right. Um, but that can, that, that's, that's awkward as well. The last book, the last novel was Transition, which was published as mainstream here, but science fiction, you know, was with the M um, uh, in the States. Oh. And that was quite deliberate. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And apparently there are people called completists that are quite annoyed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, They're going on their bookshelves with the black marker. M. Does it go there? <laughs> <laughs> You bastard buys, we have to buy two copies now. Um, <laughs> complete it. I've just got it. Complete it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, the idea behind that was I was using the, the, the template behind that was the bridge, uh, the, the third novel, what I wrote, which was sort of going towards science fiction. The was fact had no science fiction in it um, at all. Oh, several people, including Roger Payton, um, came up and I, I didn't know Ro Roger from Adam. But I mean, said, you're into science fiction, aren't you? Sorry for the bad Brummy accent, but Roger, Roger said, you, you're into science fiction, you, you read science fiction. How, <laughs> you, how did you know? And I said, it wasn't, if it didn't just one person you know, alone, then you could put that down to you know, just a, a lucky guess. But several people just read the Wasp Factor and thought, this chap's into science fiction. I still don't quite entirely understand how, but obviously there's something in there that without having any science fictional element in it at all. It's somehow, for several people who were just attuned to it, they could spot the influence. But in your head, cool. they're quite delineated. Oh, totally, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the second novel, uh, Walking on Glass, had sort of science fictional and uh, fantasy elements within it. Mm -hmm. um, and the bridge was a bit further in that direction. But after that, they went in opposite directions entirely. And the science fiction became uh, you know, sort of proper sort of space opera with considerable flavours. Um, and the mainstream became, uh, it had fewer fantastic elements within it. And the idea behind Transition uh, from last year was to try and sort of bring that uh, those two sort of streams back together again and have a book that you know, had a lot of science fictional tropes, um, whatever, in, in, within it, that it was still basically mainstream. Uh, so I kind of over-succeeded in a way, which is um, uh, basically a polite way of saying failed uh, in some, some quarters, because um, it was taken as being science fiction, um, even by my publishers. Isn't there a lot of mainstream publishers now, uh, or mainstream writers, who are putting stuff out there with a lot of science fiction in, and then... 
Yeah, but then, we're selling it as mainstream now. Yeah, so and then say no, it's not science fiction. No, I don't. I don't read. I don't write science fiction at all. Um, okay, so it's got time travel in it, but it's you know it's yeah, not it's science, science fiction. fiction. It's, <laughs> it's about people and yeah, it's uh, yeah. it's not science fiction. It's a novel of ideas, um, which is <laughs> my favourite one. <laughs> <laughs> bringing you up yeah, to date, science though. Science fiction, all ideas, right? You're fine. Sorry, go on. Bringing you up to date, though, with, with mm. the science fiction. Um, I read on Wikipedia, which of course is always accurate, that you're um, currently writing a culture book. Uh, culture. You haven't actually checked my Wikipedia entry for it. <laughs> I can do it now if you like. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I just finished it last week, and it's sort of uh, well, I didn't finish. It's in first draft form, but um, uh, yeah, the last few months have been sort of chained to me, the word processor and um, my desk and. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's another uh, big, bouncing BB culture novel all set to go, basically. That's so. going to please a lot of people. Uh, people apparently it does. It. The first person it pleases usually is my publisher. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but say, I've written a science fiction novel. Yes! Mm. It's not actually a culture novel. Oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> We're sure that'll be nice, too. <laughs> Um, Aren't you so supposed yeah. to agree these things beforehand and have like a contract and so uh, on? Don't they? Well, you've got a contract, isn't yeah. it? it actually does specify whether it's mainstream or, or science fiction, but it never specifies culture as uh -huh. such. You know? So, um, as my my, cult, my, my uh, publishers have never interfered in that way, you know. Which I think if you're being paranoid, you put it down to the fact they don't care very much. But <laughs> I, uh, which I don't. I, I've never really had any sort of uh, pressure from a publisher. I've had you know suggestions about. Um, uh, well, maybe about the length of contract or whatever, doing mm -hmm. a two book or a four book or whatever, but usually it's basically it's up to me to, to decide, um, both in intervals involved and also... Um, uh, uh, well, I mean, so far, I've, just, I've never come to a disagreement. I suppose that's the point. I mean, they, they seem to be very happy with me writing science fiction and mainstream, you know... Uh, well, talking to other writers, that seems to be quite unusual these days. I do have a very, very fierce agent. Um, the wonderful Mick Cheatham is an agent, and she's like, she's tiny. You know, you, you th everyone has this image of, of Mick as being about, you know, six foot seven, you know. Uh, but she's actually about, you know, four foot eight or something, you know, <laughs> small, not, not quite that uh, diminutive. But, um, uh, but she's a very, very fierce woman, uh, and uh, her writers are, are her cubs, and she's the tigress, and you do not get in between the two if you value your life. Um, uh, oh, I've had people on the phone in tears, I've just talked to your agent. You know. <laughs> Mum, I've told you not to use your <laughs> <laughs> um, So she's fierce. So maybe, I mean, that's what a good agent does. I mean, I'm, I'm a rubbish negotiator. You know, if my publisher says, tell you what, I'll give you a gyro for, for 10 shillings dated 1963 for your next book. I go, oh, very good, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> and it makes me, my boy's not getting out of bed for less than 500,000. <laughs> So yeah, she does what a good agent does. So maybe Mick intimidates them, I don't know. I mean, even before I had an agent, a long, long time, Crow Road was the first novel that Mick sort of came on board for, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, even before that, I never really had that sort of, that, any sort of real interference at all. So I've just been a bit lucky. I've always had a good publisher, but Milner are pretty good. And then the, um, what was now, uh, when the nice sort of part of the Hachette group, but uh, uh, Little Brown and Orbit, um, we kind of go back all the way to the paperback of uh, the Wasp Factory, mm -hmm. and so that's all the way back to like, 80, 85. And although you know, the name has changed, and to some extent the owners have as well, um, there's been a quite a continuity of, of, of people, and of, uh, you know, in that sense of you know, uh, the same company all the way through. I think that probably helps as well. Yeah. And, uh, and just having a big backlist that you know, uh, it's probably a kind of stabilising influence on both them and me as well. Well, if you're, if you're selling well, they're, yeah. they're happy, aren't they? So far, so good, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, fans of the culture will probably want to know, what can you tell us about this latest novel? Um, Without, well, obviously, you can only tell us so much, but do you have uh, a title? It's, uh, well, the, yeah, it's called Surface Detail. Um, and um, it's kind of part, the, sort of the big story behind the sort of human bits of it as well is that uh, there's lots and lots of, um, lots of civilizations, once they get sort of uh, the equivalent of soul keeper technology or whatever, or the ability to transfer mind states or to record mind states and so on, uh, it means you can be, you know, in, in a sense, uh, immortal, whatever, you can upload yourself. And that people have afterlives that, that uh, a lot of societies, rather than go for just biological immortality, you go for immortality, you still, your body sort of goes, whatever, you know. But uh, you, what you might call uh, uh, your soul in a non religious sense um, remains, and that's put into a, you know, some computational substrate, and you, ha you go and have a life um, uh, in, in there. And uh, it'd probably look a lot like a better version of World of Warcraft plus The Sims or something. <laughs> Maybe World of Peacecraft, you know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so, um, uh, and lots of scientists do this. Again, it's a culture universe, you know, 
dozens, hundreds, whatever, thousands of societies out there of that uh, technological level. Um, and at some point, some bright spark has the idea of linking them together so you can interact with others. You've got as a web you know, um, of, of afterlives. Uh, but some people are just having like heavens isn't enough. They have to have hells as well. So they're sort of and they tend to keep so quiet about it because a lot of societies regard it as you know, um, not just outré but possibly morally you know, wrong to mm. have, to have uh, sort of functioning health. So the culture, for one, is you know, having a real sort of, it's really very much down on, um, on, on torture in any sort of form. Um, it's not happy about it, but uh, they, they do exist and it's a kind of a, there's a war in heaven basically taking place. At the same time, it's also a revenge story about this girl who's got um, a fabulous sort of tattoo. Uh, and actually, she has two in the course of the book, in a sense, but one's a culture one, as it turns out. Um, uh, but she gets killed, but then she gets brought back to life again. And uh, she's basically, it's a, a, her side of the story is a revenge sort of mission. And well. this will be coming out, what, this time next year? Uh, well, I, th I thought we had agreed it was coming out in September, but I've, I, just, I've, I got my own fanzine through the post, the Bank Sony Inn. Thank you, Mr. Haddock. Um, and um, it said that it might be getting put back to, to uh, February next year. Which is news to me, I have to admit. <laughs> um, so I don't know at the moment. I tend to uh, <laughs> upbraid. What's going on to my, my publisher? So, um, Daryl, the senior director. It will be coming out at some point. Yeah, it will be. I hope. Well, I the weird thing so, about yeah. publishing is, of course, that then in February of 2011, people will be asking you about this book and the inspiration behind it, and you will have written it at uh, least a year beforehand. I mean, how does that... Does your brain actually remember all these things? Is it difficult to be asked about, you know, yes. supposedly your current project, but actually, you know, that well, was... Well, the difficulty there is I'd like the, the first three months of next year down for writing the next one, the next mm -hmm. mainstream book. So um, I might not even be around for the launch. I might miss it, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just one of the potential problems here. Um, yeah, um, it is a bit. I mean, the thing is, by that stage, it will still be pretty much... I mean, as long as I'm not writing the next one, I'm not mm -hmm. totally, you know, uh, immersed in the next one, it won't be too, good, too big a problem because... Um, you know, I've all finished the first draft, and I'm sort of slightly sort of, ah, that's nice, I can relax a bit. Yeah. Obviously, I know that there's going to be, uh, I know there'll be a lot of changes. I've already mm -hmm. started making changes. My publishers might suggest some, my agent might suggest mm -hmm. some, uh, the people I give it to, uh, who, you know, uh, they might suggest some. So there's still the second draft process mm -hmm. to go through, and then there's a copy editing stage, and then, you know, there's uh, the very last chance when you actually get the, uh, the, the bound proof, so you can still change it a little after mm -hmm. that. So it stays with you for a long time, many, many months afterwards. You know, if it was going to be September still, then it feel, in a sense, it feel quite like, continuous. So as long as it's that's still the thing that's foremost in your mind, you know, then to asking questions, uh, answering questions about it is it's actually fairly easy because um, it's still pretty fresh. It's only once you've written something else in the meantime yeah. that uh, you start to forget stuff. But even then, you can still with a very small amount of prompting. Um, it's all there, you know. Um, I mean, I, I, having said that, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not the greatest expert on modern books. There was a guy that was in Mastermind, who later won it, I might add, as well. Um, and he was answering questions about the culture as a specialist subject in the first round. I, think he's, uh, uh, I also like the guy because um, his, uh, when he did his second round thing, he did uh, uh, Father Ted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, he did the culture, and I was, and I'd, 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 someone phoned me up and said, Banksy, you're, 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 the culture is some of the special subject on Mastermind. So I turned on, and I watched, right, and he got like 26 out of 27. I got 19. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I did get the one he got wrong, but, but yeah. I think we hear the sound of a straw being grasped at here. <laughs> yeah. So what keeps you coming back? to the culture? Uh, I just love it. I mean, it's, it's, it's my personal playground. It's my big train set, you know. It's, um, it's also where I'd like to live. It's my, it's my secular heaven, you know. Um, it's genuinely at least as close as I can come to uh, you're creating a utopia. I mean, what I uh, was talking about in a panel yesterday, and it, it's my attempt to do that, to make some of it is not just, you know, a utopia for me, but, you know, arguably for as many people as you can sort of possibly imagine, really. But, um, I, but I was finding new sort of things to... To, to say about it. If, if there's nothing more, nothing new to say about the culture, then I guess I'd, I'd stop. Well, I hope I would. I hope I have the, you know, <laughs> the the uh, moral property or you know honesty to admit it and just mm. stop stop writing. You know, stop writing about the culture. But at the moment, there's still a lot to to write about, um, and it's easy enough for another novel now. And the the notes. I just one of the very last things I did at the end of um, the book there there uh, at the start of the week was. Um, go through uh, the notes for the book and just take out all the bits that I hadn't used. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this easy enough there, you know, for certainly all the background for a, a new culture novel. And, um, you know, they haven't got the actual 
well, I've kind of got hints for ideas for the next story, the actual, you know, the narrative drive bit, as it were. Uh, so uh, that will definitely be another one at the very, very least. And at the moment, it feels fairly sort of, it's on a sort of plateau cruise phase. You know, I, I can't see it running out of steam for a bit. You never know, I mean, you know. But, but it's, but it's such a... Um a vast canvas, isn't it, to, well, that, to yeah, write stories on? That's why it's easy to sort of zoom in and find a bit you mm-hmm. haven't actually covered properly, so there's always more to look at. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I see. You can never be absolutely certain, but uh, I think it's um, just, yeah, at least one more to come, and uh, probably a lot more. We shall see. Ah, we shall see. You mentioned earlier on about your three-month intensive writing process. Now, I'd written down here that it was you do six months on and then kind of six months off, but no, a novel in three well, months? Well... Um, I used to tell people that yeah, it was three months on and nine months off. Um, yeah. uh, <laughs> that used to annoy a lot of people. Kind of, kind of. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why did I do? Um, the way it actually works, right? This is version two, right? So this <laughs> delete earlier anything I said before. Doesn't wrong, right? This is what the way it actually works, right? Get this right. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Um, th- yeah. There's a three months writing mm-hmm. like the last novel in a sense. If you know what I mean. And that's sort of three months sort of working on the last novel and tinkering with it. Yep. Um, and that time I'm sort of relaxing at the same time, not thinking about a, a new novel at all. Uh-huh. And then it, the following six months, yeah, you see, so yeah, it's following six months, that's when I'm thinking really hard. <laughs> <laughs> now, it has to be admitted that to the untutored eye, it might look that like I'm just living the life of Riley. <laughs> And doing absolutely bugger all. <laughs> but you can't see what's going on inside you as well. Cogs, uh, wheels within wheels, are thinking all the time. I, I may be sitting there swigging red wine with a, a nice red wine with a curry. I might be chatting with my chums. I might be in the hills walking along, you know, with my rucksack on my back. <laughs> but I'm thinking all the time. Yes. <laughs> I think they're falling for it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that is kind of. Uh, but that's a routine you've. Yeah, that's kind of. Did you get into works, on purpose or just kind of happen? Well, I've kind of or? fallen into it. I mean, yeah. I always had this thing that the time for me to write is in the winter. Because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, as a boss, as a self employed you know, person, uh, I'm a very, very tolerant boss. And if I feel like giving myself a day off, I always do. You know. um, uh, so the whole point is that to write when the weather's rubbish outside. So I live in. Uh, um, uh, uh, central industrial belt, east bit of, of uh, central industrial belt of Scotland uh, in, in Fife. Um, and uh, it means that it's not, the weather's not that bad. I mean, mm-hmm. Compared to like uh, Gourock, where I used to live, you know, Greenock and, and the Clyde, it's like Southern California, frankly. You know. um, we do get quite a lot of rain, it's cold uh-huh. and so on. Um, uh, so it means that if, if the weather's horrible, it's a good, uh, there's no temptation to you know, run outside. If I, lived, if I did live in Southern California, I'd never write a bloody word. You know, but <laughs> haiku at the most, you know, so <laughs> big haiku where there's a, a cloud passes over the thunder. Oh, it's nice again. Oh, grab the surfboard or whatever, you know, and <laughs> off you go. Um, but, you know, so I think that's why I have to write in the, in, the, in the winter. That makes sense. Just from a purely sort of practical point of view, it means it's, it's more likely that I'll spend, you know, three or four consecutive days actually at, at, the, at my desk. Um, and is it uh, an intense period? Yeah, it's, yeah. it's pretty uh, it's a heavy flow, as it were. <laughs> yes, it's, um, uh, I, would t- I t- usually try and write about two or 3,000 words uh, a day, depending on what sort of book it is. Mm-hmm. In the case of the, this last one, I think I was averaging about 17,000 a week. It's always the weekly figure is what I tend to go on. Yeah. Um, so that uh, I've, I've usually, I usually try and write um, sort of during the, the working day and the working week so that I can socialise with friends that have got normal jobs, you know. And uh, so, yeah, trying to... And also, just, it just you need the downtime. You have to have the, the couple of days off to sort of to recharge. You can write all the way through. I, I can write, you know, straight through for, you know, forever, 15, 16 days at a time. You, you, then you really need that, that second weekend off because mm-hmm. you're just sort of a bit frazzled, you know. You, you get burned out or whatever, uh, as you do in any, any job, I guess, uh-huh. and you need the, the downtime. Um, but yeah, that, it's quite an intensive sort of period. I just spend a lot of time doing it, and uh, I definitely know that if I wake up at four o'clock in the morning thinking about the book, there's no point trying to get back to sleep. I always mm-hmm. have to get up and start work. And, uh, it doesn't mean that I've often completed my day's work by 8 a.m. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Although you need, you need to go back to bed for a snooze at that point, of course. Right? Yeah. And you've n- never thought about that six months period when you're not writing instead of thinking mm. that you would perhaps do another book or try well, something different. I did actually suggest this to me um, uh, to James Hill um, uh, many, many years ago and he said, don't, I say, don't do that. You know? <laughs> um, well, I think he still thought of me as a sort of, um, I don't think he realised I was going to d- be dabbling within science fiction at the time. Mm-hmm. So he thought I was just going to try and be, become a proper serious, you know, really well-respected literary author. 
and <laughs> poor fool. Um, <laughs> and it's like that being like overproduction, and you you won't get taken seriously if you're not taking years over a novel, or whatever you know. So, uh, so I've got this cunning plan of like you know, seeming to take at least two years over a mainstream novel, but in fact, it's really, there's been a science fiction novel that's aimed in, in in the interim, as it were. Um, so I think, but also I think it'd just be, you can sort of overproduce in a way and you mm -hmm. can just not, I, th I think, I also do believe I need that, that extra six months just to get my ideas together. Uh, you, get, you can knock something out, but that's not good enough. You have to be genuinely proud of what, what you've done. And I certainly, I need the time uh, to just organise my ideas and you know, get some sort of plan together, sort of scheme for the whole the whole thing, and you just can't really knock that together that quickly. I suppose you could in a way if you're just doing the same thing every time. But I mean, I, um, I get apart from anything else, I get bored doing the same mm. the same sort of thing. I come as close to it as I ever do with the culture itself. I, mean, I still find it exciting writing about the culture, but um, the, there's a lot of paraphernalia and stuff you know, uh, that, that's in there that, if I was simply um, doing it by rote, I, I could rely on. But uh, on, on the contrary, I try to avoid as much as I can, re much repetition in the culture as I can because you'd have no incentive to get up at four in the morning. Uh, you wouldn't be waking up thinking about the book. You'd be waking up thinking about, you know, you might walk down the shops or something, something like, like that. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Or, you know, I'd, I'd probably be playing Civilization instead, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I did hear this rumour that uh, one year this all fell to pieces when you kind of got involved in a computer game. Is this well, yeah, uh, I'm a serial... My name's Ian, and I'm a Civilization user. <laughs> But I can give it up any time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> given up several times, actually. Uh, no, I've, I've, I've definitely got it under control now because I was, I was, I was I still, I'm, I've actually gone back, I've got earlier versions of Civilization, you know, that I, I, in some ways I prefer to the, uh, the more modern ones. And um, I was playing quite a lot up until, uh, I think it was October uh, last year, September last year, and then. Um, I sat. I was. I had to think about the the, uh, the more intense planning stage of the book. So I stopped playing. Uh, I didn't play for six months. And so I, just, I had my first game. You know, in the last week or so after finishing the, the first draft of the novel. So it's obviously is actually probably under control. You know, um, I didn't. Not that I didn't bring my computer down with me. You know, I'm not disappearing off to the room. You know, sort of just found a few more cities. No, no, no. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's just. I just. It's something about the game that appeals to me. I've never been a great fan of shoot 'em up. Uh, I have an antediluvian sort of uh, view that, that no shoot em ups ever improved on the original asteroids. Um, <laughs> and one day I will ram a rock and I will survive and the rock won't. I, just, I, just, I know it will just bang. I could be wrong there, okay. You kind of dodged my question about I, is sorry. it true that you actually, uh, a book got sacrificed? No, no, uh, no, a books got sacrificed. It was books I should have been reading by other ah, authors got sacrificed. No, no, I've never. Um, now, the only time that um, uh, I was sort of missed the deadlines that were was uh, when uh, my wife, well, my, ex, my late wife now, uh, and I were splitting up. And it was just when things were really bad. And um, uh, I just couldn't concentrate. And you have to, you have to concentrate when you're, when you're writing a book. And. Um, I didn't have the, sort of the mental wherewithal, the mental resources to, to do that. So I actually had to go to my publisher. It was like being a student again. <coughs> Can I have an extension, please? <laughs> <laughs> but instead of like, would next Monday be all right? It was, would three months from now be all right? <laughs> Six months, I can't remember. It was quite a while. But, um, yeah. That's the only time I've ever actually, you know, uh, yeah, missed a deadline, really. And no sign of any writer's block happening. You just in the winter. You get oh up, you yeah, do the book. I had writer's yeah. block twice. I think once for an entire morning. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, yes, I would be laughing if I was there, but I do feel for if there's any writer who's got you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> 2003 was the last time I wrote, and I think uh, I, mean, I honestly do feel for people that get it. I, I don't, I just don't really get writer's block, you know, um, but I, I, honestly, I do certainly feel that I, I, I don't want to add to their pain by going, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, presumably your thinking time, that allows you to build up that amount of creativity and go into your writing time. Yeah, the winter I, I think, with um, the yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, you, you put your finger on it. I think, it's, I think a lot of um, uh, writer's block comes from people who are just trying to do it in that sort of uh, romantic sort of way of you know, starting with nothing except the yes. original idea or the original um, phrase or, or scene or character or whatever. I think if you sit down and sort of 
plan out what you're going to write, and it, then it's, uh, you're much less likely to suffer from writer's block because you've got something there already, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you're trying that, that way of simply starting effectively from just a single idea and seeing yeah. what happens, then you are more likely to hit a, a brick wall. You might, you, even just from a purely t technical point of view, you're more likely to hit, um, you know, paint yourself into a corner or into a, you know, a box canyon or whatever metaphor you wish to employ. You just yeah. find yourself going, oh, I can't do that, you know. Um, so, I th yeah, I think that, that's probably got a lot to do with it. I think if you sort of plan it out. But again, that kind of goes against what you're... A, a lot of the stuff that we're sort of told or is co conventionally correct in terms of writing, you know, write about what you know about. Well, there goes science fiction for a star. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, the honourable exception of uh, you know, a few people who've, who've written novels, who are basically scientists who've written novels about what they know about, mm. um, the vast majority of science fiction would just disappear. I mean, you can't actually go and research the other planets, you know, you know uh, meet other aliens. So, yeah, so sociologically, how do you get on? What happens? You, know? um, you have to write what you don't know about. And it's like such a sort of conservative um, attitude, write about what you know about. Oh, bugger that. You know, no, write about what you don't know about. We're much more interesting. Um, and I think also this idea, you, 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 you shouldn't really plan things. Again, that's like, there's a kind of snobbish thing about that. It's all about inspiration. You know, you sort of, you just wander around, you know, and you, with your cravat flowing in the breeze. You know, <laughs> and suddenly, the muse strikes you. You say, oh, I must to my desk, away! You, know. <laughs> you get out, you sort of sharpen your quill pen, you go, <laughs> and off you end up, you're a fucking romantic poet, you know, that's <laughs> bollocks, you know. Um, but that is kind of the way you're supposed to, supposed to work, you know. And I think it's, it, is, it is mostly nonsense, Frank. There will always be people who do need or want to work that way, but the vast majority of us are slightly more workmanlike or, you know, work person like approach, probably more practical. And um, it's certainly that's what works for me. You know, I think there are, there are different, different ways. Your, your mileage may differ, as our American cousins would say. <laughs> You mentioned uh, Scotland, obviously, where you live at the moment, um, and I perceive you very much as a Scottish writer. Do you think that the culture and the landscape is a big influence on your writing? Um, in a way, I hope not, in a, in a sense, because from the culture, because it is you know, over zillions of planets and, uh -huh. and all the rest of it, it shouldn't really feel too tied to any particular uh, Earth sort of culture, I guess. Um, uh, I, I don't know. But I mean, in the mainstream, aren't you often, you know, Scottish writer Ian uh, Banks? Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, that's because of, you know, uh, partly out of um, writing what you know about. I'm a big believer in doing that, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I write about Scotland quite a lot. Um, well, I mean, that's that's partly laziness. You know, I, I hate doing research. You know, the R word, as it's called in our house. Um, so I mean, obviously, it's easier for me to write. Uh, uh, um, from the point of view of you know, a, a male Scottish mm. uh, uh, man, yeah, male man, yeah, you know, a male, <laughs> male man, the, the, uh, male man, yeah, <laughs> the postman. It's a good novel. Okay, get a film. Right? Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, it's easier for me to write from the point of view of someone who's my age, my gender, my, my roughly my you know, sort of, uh, income level or whatever, or class, whatever, um, and, and living in Scotland. You mm -hmm. know, it's simply easier for me. I don't have to do the research. I can just it's all there. You know. Um, and so, so now and again, I will do that. And that's, I hope I'm not doing that just to, because it's easier. But it's, um, there are some novels that you kind of require that. Uh, the Dead Air, the one about the, uh, the, um, the radio DJ. Uh, it was always going to be a very sort of loose, fluid uh, uh, a, a book where the guy's just talking at you all the time. And so it was so much easier for me to, to do that from someone who's like me and, and all those. You know, Respect, um, but from that point of view, yeah, I mean, the mainstream's definitely got uh, the, the feel of Scotland in there a lot of the time. I'm deliberately not always, of course, but uh, the culture—I don't know. I, I think there's, I think probably in, in political terms, there's probably a slight um, uh, essence. I think Scotland is more com communitarian, as well, slightly <coughs> more left-wing um, than than uh, Britain as a whole is, and England is, if you like, mm -hmm. and uh, certainly you know, the, this this part of England. You know, um, London, a large city in the southeast of, of England. You know, um, so I think there's maybe a, an element of that, I suppose. That there's still a sort of um, the, the uh, I'm absolutely not a libertarian, um, and I'm deeply suspicious of any um, political uh, movement that holds up Ayn Rand. You know, who said that she regarded altruism as a swear word. You know, fuck that. You know, um, I think not. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm vaguely, uh, I'm of that age, you know, I'm just happy to, to be an old lefty, really, you know. Uh. But, you know, there's plenty of writers living in Surrey, so they can do the stuff in England, that's fine. Of course they can, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just, I, mean, I, I just like Scotland, apart from anything else, I, I, I sort of, I do feel I fit in there sort of better, I suppose. But you did so. spend a time 
in England, didn't you? Yeah, I thought it'd be better to be close to the publishers. Complete nonsense, you know. Uh -huh. It uh, did, didn't work that way at all. It didn't mean I could go and sort of actually deposit the novels on the receptionist's uh, uh -huh. desk, but that, that wasn't, apart from saving the postage and every, uh, every Mickle Max or Muckle. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that, you know, it's something of a false economy that I actually had to live in London, you know. Um, <laughs> So, um, yeah, it, it, I, yeah I, I'm, I'm glad I did, you know, and at first I really enjoyed living in London, but I mm -hmm. kind of got fed up with it in the end, you yeah. know, and uh, uh, I find it quite difficult to come to London nowadays. And I think it's not just because it's a great big city, I don't really like big cities. Uh, I, I definitely prefer Paris to London. I was trying to work out exactly why. I mean, I've always liked the French, believe it or not, and I've always liked the, the Parisians. I've never really found them that rude. Um, uh, <laughs> Except at that, that time they put on the English accent and had the English flag and... No, no. Um, and seriously, uh, I think it's because there's so many people, this, this London is so much the centre of the kind of people, and it's the bankers, it's, it's the intensely wealthy, it's the, the, the level of incompetence, wealth, arrogance uh, that we've, that we've now come to associate with the, the banking community as a whole. So I probably wouldn't like New York anymore either, you know, but um, I think there's a def I definitely feel uncomfortable being in London. That, and it's a great place in so many ways. I've got great friends here, but uh, it's just something about the, 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 the arrogance of the greed, I think, that really gets to me. You know. I probably I should go and stay in the, the, the you know, down home bits of London. I shouldn't stop going, I should stop going to bloody Mayfair or something. I don't know. You know. Um, yeah, that's what, I think that's part of it. I, the Scotland suits me better. Whereas mm -hmm. We are slightly more left wing up there, and that just you know, uh, that makes me feel happier, I think. It's as simple as that. You, know. you can't take the, the old lefty out of you know, the chat and time. We have uh, five minutes till we need to wrap up, um, and I think perhaps time for a few questions from the audience. Now, we can't really see you. <laughs> because we've got lights in our eyes, but there is somebody... Aha. Oh, the house lights! Magically, they appear! There is somebody, I believe, with a roving microphone. If they're very quick to rove... <laughs> Tech, <laughs> hello! You could just shout. Uh, this, I mean, yeah. Ah, man, man there. Uh, right behind you, there's a gentle, gentleman in the third row. There you go. Hello there. Hello. Uh, your first... Oh, I loved the Wasp Factory. factory. It was brilliant. Um, there's been two stages... And my mic's somewhat So I can just dubious, hear you. But, uh, uh, there's been two stage adaptions so far. Um, I've seen both of them. I thought they were marvellous. But um, has anyone ever approached you about doing either a TV or film adaption? Because it would make a wonderful movie. Um, yeah, there's a whole old terrible, long, uh, and rather depressing story about the... the well, until now, uh, but, uh, but the Wasp Factory film adaptation uh, goes long way, 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 way back, and uh, it, it was horrible, and uh, even cost me a lot of money as well. Um, well, there's an Irish company, um, Strongbow, I thought, great, free cider for life. Um, <laughs> And they bought the rights, and then they were bought over by an American company. And the one thing I was always trying to avoid was having the Wasp Factory taken over by an American company. Not because I hate Americans, because almost inevitably they would set it in America and have the American actors. I wanted it to be uh, you know, shot, at least as if, in, in, in Scotland. Ireland would do, because uh, the scenery is similar. Uh, but you know, I wanted it to be a British, a, a Scottish you know, sort of feel to it. Um, and sure enough, the first, when I got these people bought it over, and we couldn't stop them because they, I didn't have an agent at the time, and the, the letter of agreement was, was sketchy, to say the least. So they were within their rights to do what they did, to buy it as a property from this company that we'd actually sold it to, deliberately as it were. Um, and if I got the first draft script, it opens in a boxcar. Frank, um, the main character, is in a boxcar going across the wheat fields of Kansas or whatever, you know, it's America. Oh, fuck, here we go. <laughs> uh, and sure enough, they transferred the whole story to, to the States, you know. Um, so uh, a bit pissed off, and uh, they started uh, they, they had a chance to make it up until a certain date, and we, they, then uh, it, the, the rights reverted. But if they'd started principal photography, then uh, the, the rights went on with them. But uh, pointing a video camera at uh, a man in, in a, a, a phone booth in Los Angeles with a dog barking outside is not principal photography. So we had a big court case, uh, or started to have a big court case in Ireland, where the original agreement had been sort of, uh, signed within the auspices of uh, and eventually agreed to settle, and, but, but because of, I was given that a 40% chance that, uh, of, of success, or, or was it failure? And it didn't sound great either way, if the judge you know, got out of bed on the wrong side that, that morning in Dublin. So we had to sort of, anyway, the, recently it's all come good again, because they forgot to, 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 to do that trick the second time, and um, the rights came free, it was about last year. So we've actually got two highly recognisable sort of film company or director names involved uh, who are very interested. And so with a bit of luck, we'll be signing um, you know, an agreement to turn the Wasp Factory into a motion picture uh, this year. Fingers crossed. 
Happy but as they say in Hollywood, don't hold your breath. I'd be very <laughs> happy to see that. Thank you, thank you very much. Any more? Everyone wants to ask questions. Gather in this little area <laughs> yes, down here. Yeah. Well done. That's <laughs> good forward thinking. Well, you know. <laughs> I was just going to ask, um, really like the algebraist, uh, or braced. I've got to tell the shit clear myself. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we get, got called Algae the for some reason. You know, yeah. I remember that. Was, is there going to be any more in that universe? Uh, I don't think so. No. Uh, again, when I looked, went through the, the ideas uh, after I'd written it, uh, there was just, I hadn't used most of them. Well, I had used about half of them. Uh, so in theory, there's plenty of, sort of background material there for a, a, a sort of follow-up. But I'd, I'd, I'd have to come up with another MacGuffin, like the, the Dweller List thing about the, where the, the, the oh, extra, the, extra yeah, portals are. Yeah. And until I come up with another you know, idea on that sort of scale, um, I'll tell you this for nothing. Was, you know how at the end of the novel, um, it, it turns out, oh, well, I won't give it away in case someone's going to read it, but um, <laughs> um, and the, it's up to the dwellers where they actually let everybody else use the... <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> they don't. <laughs> if there was going to be a second one, that's how it would start. Go, what? <laughs> that means nothing to quite a lot of you. Anyway. <laughs> Bloody funny, you know. Our secret's safe. <laughs> um, I th we'll squeeze in one more, because I know they want us to wind up. Yeah. So, over there. Uh, your stories often seem as though they could be told in a fairly straightforward narrative arc linearly, but you often, contrary to that, shuffle things up, time slice them. So when you're starting to read the book, and you get six different character perspectives, you assume they're linear in time and so on, and you find out half of them were from a thousand years ago. Presumably you did that deliberately. What do you think that brings to the book? Confusion, mostly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a flippity gibbet when it comes to it. Um, I think it's, it's trying to sort of keep narrative drive. I mean, one of the things about, if you've got lots of different sets of characters, then there's a great trick you can do, which is simply you leave out the boring bits in between. When you're moving them from point A to point B, you leave out all the rubbish in between uh, so that the, the, and the reader's mind fills in it. But if you simply told their story in a completely linear fashion, then the, the, the sort of jump cuts from one scene to another would they'd kind of show up. They'd, 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 you'd sort of stumble over them. The fact that you've had another character's story in between means that the brain just glosses over that. It's like, it's like the way the, the, the eye deals with, with moving images. You sort of fill in the bits that aren't really there, whatever. Well, like television, you know, if you know what I mean. Um, so I th and that is, it's really about that, that. That's what I'm trying to achieve, I suppose. But and you don't say a thousand years well. earlier or something. Sorry? But you don't say a thousand years earlier, these other characters. Well, I, I, I sometimes think that I might. And other times I think, oh, what the hell? A little confusion is good for the brain. You know, so, <laughs> you know. But it, it's a balancing act. I mean, I, I, so there's a lot of people that find... Um, I think sometimes my sentences are too long as well. That's, and now just I try to go through, um, and I, I do miss this, this chat I, I mentioned before, James Hale, who was a brilliant editor. Um, and James would sit, he'd go through every single bloody you know, word and comma in, in the book. And I try to, I try to imagine James looking over his, you know, looking over my shoulder, going, "Now, Banksy, you don't really need all those adjectives, you know. Or this little bit could be tightened up." Um, uh, and it, but it's hard, and it's, it's, it's difficult to, to truly do that. And I've got great editors and you know, lots of help and so on. But um, uh, it, it comes a point, I think, where uh, you, in some ways, your own sort of reputation kind of goes before you, and, and people think, well, it's not, you're not a first novelist, so um, people know that there's a good chance the book will sell anyway. So people are less inclined to sort of, uh, to interfere in a way. But, uh, so you have to do your own interfere. You have to interfere with yourself, frankly. You know. <laughs> Oh, it's a lot of fun, obviously. Well, um, uh, we're running out of time. We've run out of time, really. Ben Goldacre is next, I believe, in this hall. You'll be signing babies and kissing books at I one o'clock. I shall, one o'clock, yes. One um, two. Thank you very much, Ian M. Banks. Thank you very much. Thank you.